Okay, good morning. We are back in Hebrews 8, 6 through 12 again uh, this morning. Uh, if you'll open up your Bibles to there, I'll read this passage of Scripture. The author of Hebrews writes, But now he has gotten a more excellent ministry, also by so much as he is a mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first was faultless, place would not have been salt for a second. For finding fault, he said to them, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, and I will make an end on the house of Israel and on the house of Judah. A new covenant shall be. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day of my taking hold of their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I did not regard them, says the Lord. Because this is the covenant which I will covenant with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, giving my laws into their mind and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall no more teach each one their neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because all shall know me from the least of them to their great ones. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses, and I will not at all remember their sins and their lawless deeds. Okay. So the past few weeks I've been given a summary of what we have gone over so far in this series. I'm going to continue in that same pattern today. We began our discussion on God's covenants with what we termed as the eternal covenant of God's glory. This is the covenant that is within the Trinity, that is, in unison with the eternal purpose of God. This covenant is that which was eternally made in between the Father and the Son whereby the Father promised to give the Son of God two groups of people. One group for the Son to save and demonstrate mercy to, and the other group to judge and to demonstrate His wrath in. This was so that God would be made known. We then followed this sermon up the next week by establishing that there was a covenant with Adam in the Garden of Eden. But this covenant wasn't one that promised life to Adam upon the condition of his obedience, if for whatever probationary period people would like to impose on that. That's not what was there. For anyone that would like to learn about that covenant, you can refer back to the sermon that was preached two, years, two weeks ago. But what this covenant did ensure, what this covenant did promise is that Adam would die upon his disobedience. After this sermon, we discussed last week the dichotomous nature of the Abrahamic covenant. We spoke about how the old and new covenants proceeded forth from Abraham as we looked at Paul's allegorical treatment of Hagar and Sarah in Galatians 4. We spoke of how the Old Covenant was a covenant of works and why that was so. It was in order that Christ would come and fulfill that law and merit life thereby, which he then extends to the elect through the, impu through the imputation in the New Covenant. Yet primarily we made note of how all of God's covenants that are enacted in time serve the purpose of the one eternal covenant of God that is within the Trinity. We did this by demonstrating how once the old covenant had served its purpose to the eternal covenant of God's glory, that this made the old covenant no longer necessary. And our author here in this letter to the Hebrews tells us as much at the end of this chapter in verse eight or verse 13, where he says that the old covenant 
was made obsolete by the bringing in of the new. With that said, we will proceed to today's message. We're going to be looking at how God's covenants relate to the people that they are made with. If you'd like to open up your Bibles, I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 19. I'll start in verse 4. And this is where the old covenant was established. The Lord God says, You have seen what I did to Egypt, and I bore you on wings of eagles and brought you to me. And now if listening, you will listen to my voice and will keep my covenant, you shall become a special treasure to me above all the nations, for all the earth is mine. And you shall become a kingdom of priests for me, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And Moses came and called the elders of the people. And he put all these words before them, which Jehovah commanded him. Much like a covenant of marriage identifies the parties of the covenant. Even so, God's covenants identify the parties involved. Here we see that the Old Covenant was made with the physical nation of Israel. As we spoke about last week, this covenant was conditional upon the people's obedience. Yet we know that no one was able to keep this covenant, save the true Israel, who would come born of a virgin daughter of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another passage that demonstrates who the Old Covenant was made with is Deuteronomy 5, 2, and 3. It says, Jehovah your, your God cut a covenant with us in Horeb. Jehovah did not cut this covenant with our fathers, but with us. <clears throat> Even us, these here today, all of us alive, it's important to note that the physical nation of Israel as God's people did not make up those who are eternally loved of God. In fact, God hated the vast majority of them. He swore in his wrath that they would not enter his rest. He hardened them. He set up Christ as a stumbling stone for many of them. He made their table a snare and a trap. He gave the majority of them the oracles of God and then sent his son to them first so that they would incur more judgment than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Therefore, the physical nation of Israel served as God's people as a carnal seed. To bring forth his Messiah. They served as a God ordained picture. And shadow of many New Testament realities. Yet when the seed came. God would judge them. Not long after. By destroying their capital. And temple. This happened in 70 AD. Last week we established that the old covenant was made obsolete when Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the covenant. Therefore, with the old covenant being made obsolete, there is no covenant of God to identify the physical nation of Israel as the people of God. No covenant equals no people. Remember what we said initially, God's covenants identify his people. And so when the Old Covenant was made obsolete, there's nothing there to identify that physical nation as the people of God. Yet who was the New Covenant made with? In Je we, we just read this in Hebrews 8, but going back to where our author cites from in Jeremiah 31, 31, God prophesies through the prophet Jeremiah and he says, Behold, the days come, says Jehovah that I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The new covenant was made with Israel as well. But this does 
But does this mean that the new covenant was addressed to the physical nation of Israel? Many believe this is so. I have spoke with some recently who deny that the new covenant is with the church. Why they would then partake of the Lord's Supper is beyond me. Yet this dispensational heresy fails to understand who exactly exactly Israel is under the new covenant. Let's take a look at what our Messiah did to Israel as a people group at his coming. In Acts 3 verse 22, Peter writes in his sermon, or actually Luke wrote, of, wrote it when he recorded Peter's sermon. It says, For Moses indeed said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet from among your brothers, one like me. You shall hear him according to all things, whatever he may speak to you. And it shall be that of every soul, whoever should not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Peter here in his sermon cites a prophecy of Moses found in Deuteronomy 18. Specifically, it's verses 15, 16, and 19. And Peter applies this prophecy to Christ. What I want to point out about this prophecy is that Moses stated that everyone that would not hear this prophet would be destroyed from the people. Therefore, when Christ came, he preached the gospel to national Israel and everyone that did not hear this prophet was removed or destroyed from the people. This means that they were no longer Israel. Even though they were, they were born as physical descendants of Abraham, Christ destroyed them from the people. <clears throat> Therefore, when Christ died on the cross and inaugurated the new covenant, which is addressed to Israel, the only ones who were Israel were those that had believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, of that prophet like unto Moses. All of the physical Jews who did not hear the prophet were no longer Israel. They were destroyed from the people. Paul puts it this way, speaking to the physical Gentiles of the church in Rome. Romans eleven seventeen. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and became a share of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, it is not you that bears the root, but the root bears you. You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, or some translations render it quite right. For unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be high-minded, but fear. This also answers our next question of how the nations or the Gentiles receive the blessing of Abraham. How the nations receive the new covenant blessing that was only addressed to Israel. These beloved Gentiles are grafted into Israel through faith. It only makes sense. If faith is what kept the Jews as Jews at the coming of that prophet like unto Moses, Christ, then if the Gentiles would believe the prophet, would they not then be regarded as, the, as seed? Obviously so. For Romans 2.28, it's written, 
He is not a Jew that is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that outwardly in the flesh, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly, and circumcision is of heart, in spirit, not in letter, of whom the praise is not from men, but from God. And Philippians 3.2, look out for the dogs, look out for the evil workers, look out for the concision party, for we are the circumcision. Who, who are? The ones who worship by the Spirit of God and who glory in Christ Jesus and who do not trust the flesh or who put no confidence in the flesh. But what about the physical part of it? Why aren't we in a land? Why don't we make up a physical nation with one ethnicity? This answer is explained here in Matthew 21, 43. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke to the Pharisees and the leaders of the physical nation of Israel. And he said, because of this, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and it will be given to a nation producing the fruits of it. And here in Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven from where we also wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ came, he not only broke off or destroyed unbelieving Jews from Israel, but he also effectively removed the theocracy from the land and placed it in heaven. The theocracy is what he is speaking of when he references the kingdom in Matthew 21, verse 43. A theocracy is a God-governed nation. He removed this from the land and he placed it in heaven. What did he say? He says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and it will be given to a nation producing the fruits of it. <clears throat> this is one reason why Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. According to Paul in Philippians 3.20, our citizen, the citizenship of God's people is in heaven. This is our status. We are not tied to some earthly land, but our home resides in heaven where Christ is. This is why the scripture tells us that we are aliens and strangers here. Now, as to the king of this kingdom, whose throne is Christ seen as seated upon? Acts 2.29 Being a prophet then, this is Peter speaking again, being a prophet then and knowing that God swore with an oath to him, that is David, that of the fruit of his own loin, as concerning the flesh, to raise the Christ to sit on his throne. Foreseeing, he spoke about the resurrection of, of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up of which we, we all are witnesses. Then being exalted to the right of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not sin, ascend into heaven, but he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I place those hostile to you as a footstool for your feet. How many times have we saw them quote Psalm 110? That's where he's referencing back to. Then assuredly let all the house of Israel acknowledge that God made him both Lord and Christ, this same Jesus whom you crucified. Peter tells us here that David spoke of the resurrection of Christ when he prophesied in the Psalms. Peter says that David spoke of the resurrection because David knew God's promise to him that God would 
uh, seat, one of his seed on David's throne. Therefore, Christ ascending to the right side of the Father is the fulfillment of the promise made to David. That David would perpetually have a descendant upon the throne of Israel. Even so, it is today as Christ reigns over his true people, Israel, in the heavenlies, where also their citizenship resides. The true Israel is the church of God. So much so that Paul could observe the physical Jews and say of them as they continued to sacrifice in the temple while it stood during Paul's day in 1 Corinthians 10, 18. Look at Israel according to the flesh. Now, now what, let me first make note. What's the point of saying Israel according to the flesh unless there's an Israel according to the spirit? <laughs> there, there's no point. 1 Corinthians 10, 18. Look at Israel according to the flesh. Are not those eating the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What then do I say? That an idol is anything? Or that an idolatrous sacrifice is anything? He's calling the Jews sacrifices in the temple sacrifices made to idols. But aren't they sacrificing to Jehovah? Well, they said they were. But what did the Lord say about their sacrifice that we learned about a few weeks ago, if you'll recollect that to your memory? <clears throat> Verse 20. But the things the nations sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. What does he call them? He looks at Israel. What does he say? Look at Israel according to the flesh. Singular. <laughs> Look at Israel according to the flesh. It's in the singular. And then he refers to them as nations. Plural. Why? Because he's regarding them as Gentiles. And he does this without missing a beat. He says, but the things that the nations, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to god but i do not want you to become sharers of demons you cannot drink the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the table of the lord and a table of demons these are his observations concerning sacrifices in the temple because the temple was still standing when paul wrote to the people in Corinth. Paul doesn't even miss a beat. And it's almost as if he expects those who are in Corinth to understand that they are the true Israel of God. And those fleshly Jews are a part of what makes up the nations or the Gentiles. You know, it's just a part of his speech. I mean, his appeal to them here is that they would uh, be admonished that they cannot partake of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. It's an impossibility. True believers will not do it. That's the point. And in his point, within his point, he just it's just there. That's why I said it's like he expected them to know it. The people in Corinth were, were a physically Gentile congregation. And he says, look at Israel after the flesh. And then he says, the things that the nations sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. He calls Israel after the flesh Gentiles. Paul understood the new covenant. Paul understood the purpose of the eternal covenant of God's glory. Paul understood what God has did throughout history. Paul deals with this issue in Romans 9 as well. He assumes that there would be those who read the new covenant promises being addressed to Israel and would ask if the word of God had failed. Because when the Messiah came, the majority of physical Israel remained in unbelief. 
Yet Paul corrects his reader's understanding of who Israel is in one swift verse. Romans 9, 6. And it's not, however, that God's word has failed. For not all those of Israel are Israel. And he goes on to explain further. Verse 7. Nor because they are Abraham's seed are all children. But in Isaac, a seed shall be called to you. That is, not the children of the flesh or the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for a seed. For the word of promise is this. According to this time, I will come and a son will be to Sarah. And not only so, but also Rebekah conceiving of one, our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of the one calling. It was said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser. Even as it has been written, I love Jacob and I hated Esau. Paul is explaining that those who are to inherit salvation from Christ that was purposed eternally in the mind of God are those who have been eternally elected and loved of God. This means that being a part of a physical nation has nothing to do with your participation in the people of God, but rather God's election of some has everything to do with participation in the true Israel. John the Baptist said it when he told the self-righteous Pharisees that God could raise up from these stones children for Abraham. John knew that nationality and genealogy had nothing to do with being a part of the true Israel of God. Those who are in the new covenant and serve the risen king who sits on David's throne are in this covenant because of the election of grace. Because they have been eternally loved of God, and God in love for his Son has purposed to give them to him. His salvation and blessing was extended to them in the old covenant through his future-looking promise. Paul makes note of this. The promised children are counted as seed, Paul says in Romans 9.8. The promise came to Isaac and not to Ishmael. Jacob and not to Esau. Though they all were physically descended from Abraham, the promise only went to a select remnant of grace. Perhaps God chose physical birth as a contrast to grace in the canon of Scripture because physical birth is quite possibly the smallest contribution one could make to seek to establish his righteousness upon. Yet God excludes this from entrance into his true people Israel. How much more than the choosing of man as so many suppose that they are accepted by today. My point there is, is that you have n absolutely nothing to do, like as far as your, as far as putting forth effort in being born, who you're born to, whether you're this person's descendant or this person's descendant. And the Jews supposed themselves right with God because they were Abraham's descendants. I mean, that seems like grace, doesn't it? We were just born to this guy. We didn't have anything to do with it. There's no, there's no effort or exertion there to put forth to merit your favor with God. The fact that you just have this pedigree, the fact that you just have this genealogy, but, but the fact that God excludes genealogy, that he excludes who you're born to as a basis of righteousness before him? What did John the Baptist say? 
God could raise up for these stones children from Abraham. That, that was John the Baptist excluding their grounds of boast before God. How much more than a person's choice? Is there not more exertion in a choice to merit the favor of God than there is just physical birth? So if God excludes physical birth as a basis of your justification, how much more does he exclude a person's choice and willing as a basis to form a ground of justification before him? All right, with that said, we'll move along now. We're going to look at 1 Peter 2, 9. Peter writes, But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for possession, so that you may openly speak of the virtues of the one who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You who then were not a people, but now are the people of God. The one not pitied then, but now pitied. Beloved, I exhort you as pilgrims and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your behavior good among the nations. In that which they speak against you as evildoers, by observing your good works they may glorify God in a day of visitation. Who's the nations here? those who don't believe the gospel, those who are outside of the true Israel of God. In light of all of this, the one thing that I would encourage us in light of what has been spoken is that this is not our home. Our citizenship does not belong here. We are aliens. Christ has left us in this world for the time being to proclaim his excellencies that the fullness of the elect will be saved and that the reprobate will fill up the full measure of their sins. We therefore are to abstain from fleshly lusts while we remain here dwelling in our tents. These fleshly lusts war against our soul, that which has been renewed to the image of God as we spoke about last week. We are the nation, singular of our God. Our conduct is to be good among the Gentiles, the nations, plural. There's many nations that do not serve our God. There's one nation that is holy, that is set apart. What do you say? We are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for possession. It's only one of those, one bride who have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We are to be a set-apart people. We are to know that they will speak of us, they, the Gentiles, the nations, they will speak of us as evildoers. They'll look at our doctrine, they'll call that evil. They hate righteousness. They seek to flee from the light. Yet even in light of these of this false speech from them, they observe our good works and they know, they see. We are to give them no reason to blaspheme God in light of us. Think about what Paul said in Romans 2. Let us seek to live upright lives in light of the mercies that have been bestowed upon us regarding our lives in this world as nothing. Here are some scriptures for our meditation. So real quick, maybe, let me rephrase that another way. In, in this world, we should seek to live upright lives in light of God's mercy that has been bestowed upon us. And we should, re to do this, to live an upright life, we should regard our lives in this world as nothing. This is not our home. We're aliens, we're strangers, we're sojourners here. So how are we to hold our life in this world? Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him bear his cross and let him follow me. 
For whoever may desire to save his life will lose it. But whoever may lose his life for my sake will find it. For what will a man be benefited if he should gain the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give as an exchange for his soul? Acts 20 verse 24. But I make account of nothing. Some translations read, I count my life as nothing. Nor do I hold my life precious to myself so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus fully to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all will see my face no more, among whom I went about proclaiming the kingdom of God. Because of this, I testify to you on this day that I am pure from the blood of all. For I did not keep back from declaring to you all the counsel of God. Then take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit placed you as overseers to shepherd the assembly of God, which he purchased through his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And out of you, yourselves, will rise up men speaking perverted things in order to draw away the disciples after themselves. Because of this, watch, remembering that I did not cease admonishing each one with tears night and day for three years. And now, brothers, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build up and to give you inheritance among all those being sanctified. I have desired the silver or gold or clothing of no one, but you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my needs. And to those who were with me, I showed you all things, that working in this way we ought to help those being weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Philippians 2. Then if there is any comfort in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassions fulfill my joy that you think the same, having the same love, one in soul, minding the one thing, doing nothing according to party spirit or self-glory, but in humility, esteeming one another as surpassing themselves, each not looking at the things of themselves, but each also the things of others. For think this within you, which mind was also in Christ Jesus, who subsisting in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, having become in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, having become obedient until death, even the death of a cross. Okay. Today we're going to be exposing the heresy of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism maintains that there are two peoples of God. It maintains that God has a plan and a purpose for physical Jews and that God also has a plan and a purpose for the church. The two groups, according to dispensationalism, never mix and they never intermingle. One is heavenly and the other earthly. It is basically dispensationalism. It's basically the continuation of the Jewish mis misconception of who Christ was to be. Or in other words, who the Jews, who the unbelieving Jews thought the Messiah was going to be when he came to them. 
When Jesus came into this world, many of the unbelieving Jews thought that the Messiah was coming to save them from the reign of Rome and to establish his reign uh, on earth by taking his seat upon David's throne. For the most part, what dispensationalists are saying is that the Jews were right, the unbelieving Jews were right about this, but they just did not understand that as aspects of this were to happen later. This is why the dispensationalists hold that there will be a rapture of the church before Christ returns. And then Jesus will establish an earthly kingdom in the physical land of Israel where the temple will be rebuilt and sacrifices will be made once again. As we have already seen both in this sermon and previous ones, that this goes against the gospel and what the Bible teaches about the people of God as well as his covenants. I'm going to take a moment now and read four heretical quotes by popular dispensationalists stating what they believe to be foundational dispensational doctrine. J.N. Darby. The church is in relationship with the Father and the Jews with Jehovah. The Jewish nation is never to enter the church. The church is a kind of heavenly economy during the rejection of the earthly people. That was written in his book, The Hoax of the Church of God. Here, here's one from uh, Schaefer. The dispensationalist believes that throughout the ages, God is pursuing two distinct purposes. One related to the earth with earthly people and earthly objectives involved, while the other is related to heaven with heavenly people and heavenly objectives involved. And that's from his book entitled Dispensationalism. Here's another man, very popular. He wrote a study Bible, Charles, Charles Ryrie. He writes, a dispensationalist keeps Israel and the church distinct. The church is a distinct body in this age, having promises and a destiny different from Israel's. He wrote that uh, in a book entitled The Basis of the Premillennial Faith. John Walward, <coughs> of prime importance to the premillennial interpretation of scripture, is the distinction provided in the New Testament between God's purpose for the church and his purpose for the nation of Israel, the millennial kingdom. Ultimately, what these men fail to see is the, the one eternal purpose of God in creation. To lay this out, I'd like to read from our Christian Confession of Faith. This is taken from uh, part 2D1A in the Christian Confession of Faith. It states, In eternity past, God the Father covenanted with God the Son, Jesus Christ, to glorify himself by saving a particular elect people, and those only, from the guilt and defilement of sin by the atoning blood and imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. In covenanting with Jesus Christ, God the Father covenanted with all the elect in Jesus Christ to be their God and to reveal his divine love, mercy, grace, and wisdom to them by saving them through the work of Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. Further, as part of the terms of this covenant, the Father decreed to send the Holy Spirit to indwell his elect people. When scripture speaks of God's covenant, it does not mean a conditional agreement or contract between two parties. Rather, it means a bond of friendship and fellowship 
that is unilaterally enacted by God, whether between the Father and Son or between God and his people. Now, we know that it was conditional in between God and the physical nation of Israel, but that wasn't his covenant, the eternal covenant being extended to them. That was a covenant that was put in place for the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to fulfill on behalf of his people so that his covenant, singular, would be extended to the elect. And we know that the covenant that is made with the elect of God, with those that God has eternally loved, it is unconditional and it is unilaterally enacted by God. <clears throat> the exact number of the elect is known only to God himself. It cannot be increased or diminished. The elect of God are scattered among every tribe, nation, and language on earth. This election was not owing to any merits in those elected. There are conditions they would meet, whether foreknown or foreordained, but only to the free grace and goodness of God alone. When scripture speaks of God's foreknowledge, it is not speaking of a prior knowledge of men's actions, although God had such knowledge, but a love for their persons. Okay. With that said, I'm going to make a few comments on dispensationalism. So with what we read, the dispensationalists, if they would understand what we just read from our confession, they would not, they, they would never come to the idea of dispensationalism. But I think that in my interaction with people who hold that Jesus Christ died for everyone and then they condition salvation on themselves, a great deal of them also, or a great many of them, also hold the dispensationalism. And so in the view of dispensationalism, God has two groups of people that are, um, God they see that God still has Israel as his people. And they see that God has an eternal purpose for Israel. And so when these people want to refute election, they use dispensationalism as a base, basis for their refutation of the doctrine of election. They do this by going to passages like Romans 9 and saying that election was only concerning the uh, physical nation of Israel. And there's election doesn't have anything to do, to do with the church. They think that election was just a part of God electing the physical nation of Israel. And so then they exclude it from God's people, the church, so they don't have to worry about it. They can put it on the back of their mind and say, well, that's just Israel, that's not us, that's just the Jews. That's not us. God just hated the nation of Edom and he loved the nation of Israel. And they don't understand what we've just explained in our sermon. They also don't understand the purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God, which is what I said. And what is the eternal purpose of God? The eternal purpose of God is that he would be glorified, and that he would be made known in all of who he is, as Trinity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the salvation of one group of people that he has eternally loved, and in the damnation of another group of people that he has eternally hated. <clears throat> That's his purpose. And he has accomplished that purpose through the death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago. On Calvary. When he died on the cross. And how was he glorified? How was he glorified? He was glorified as a just God. And a savior. How was he glorified as a just God? Because he took all the sin of God's people. All of their lying. Stealing looking with lust, evil intentions, blasphemies, idolatries, fornications, murders, boasting, 
evil conniving, sorcery, dissensions, strife, envies, all of the things that come out of our heart from the, on the inside. And he demonstrated that he would not just wink at our sin. He demonstrated that he would not take a bribe, that he would not forgive at the expense of being just. He demonstrated that he is too pure and holy to have fellowship with that which is contrary to him. By taking these, this sin, our sin nature, who we are, as evil workers before we're converted. And he imputed that, he charged that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he made a statement, not just a statement, but he set Christ forth publicly as propitiation that when his only begotten son that he had eternally loved and had fellowship with. When this one was made sin, God the Father would pour out his wrath on his son. so that God could be a just God and a Savior. It demonstrates His justice. It demonstrates His righteousness because He is not these things. And it demonstrates how He has also forgiven His people. It demonstrates His love that He would take these things, who we are as enemies of God by nature, those who are following Satan, the prince of the power of the air, running as far away as we can from him. And he would take who we are and put that on the one that he loved because of who he was. And then he would pour his wrath out on him. You see, I, it's not, he didn't, he doesn't accept us because we want relationship with him, like a man told me this week. That's not a sinner running away from him. That's not salvation by grace. That's something to be loved about us. If we wanted relationship with him, that's something lovable. No, we were running far away from God. God had to seek us out and save us. We were haters of God. This is grace. God being rich in mercy, not because we love God, but because he loved us, gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then the only reason that we love him is because he first loved us and he sends his spirit into our hearts, whereby which we cry out, Abba, Father. He produces love in us. That's how far we are away from him. We cannot save ourselves. And so this all demonstrates his loving kindness towards us that is completely unconditional. And in that, it demonstrates his grace that he would do this for us. And there's nothing that we can look to in and of ourselves whereby we can claim that we're saved because of this, because I was born to this man because I made a choice, because I repented, because I believed, and not to negate repentance and faith. Repentance and faith, though, are gifts. They're gifts from God. They come from the cross. We believe because we have been saved. We don't believe to be saved. And then also the cross glorifies God. It makes God known. It accomplishes his eternal purpose. Because it excludes another group. It excludes another group from salvation. 
that God has eternally hated. That God has set apart for destruction. And then he caused them to this cross in order to judge them. The cross is preached, the gospel is preached to them. And Jesus Christ says, I praise you, Father in heaven, for you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. And then you know what else he says there, a little small phrase? He says, for such was well-pleasing in thy sight. Why did he do it that way? Because it was well-pleasing to him. It seemed good in his sight. I think another translation says it seemed good in, in the Father's sight to do this. And so this is all his work. People this week said that these doctrines are boring. There's no point. There's no purpose. Many times we're accused of what we just stated and what we believe for having no purpose for God to elect. We just gave you the purpose. It's his glory. It's his glory. We just explained that. It's his glory as Trinity. It's his good pleasure to do this as Trinity because it's all about him and it's not about us. These people accuse us of having no purpose in the doctrine of election because the only purpose that they see as meaningful in their eyes by their own standard of judgment is themselves. And if it can't be about them, then it's not going to be about God because they hate God. And, and when you recognize that was us before conversion. And so if they are to come to believe it's got to be of God, There's no escaping that deception of your own will. You're enslaved to it. You're, you're held captive by it. God has to rescue you. And if they are elect, they will be rescued. They will be rescued. But they will be rescued through the means of the preaching of the gospel, which is why we must be zealous to proclaim what we've been given to know. So with that said, we'll end with Psalm 89, a poem of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing of the mercies of Jehovah forever. I will speak with my mouth your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. You shall establish your faithfulness in the heavens I have cut a covenant with my elect. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall thank your wonders, O Jehovah. Also your faithfulness in the assembly of the saints. For who in the sky shall be ranked with Jehovah? Who among the sons of the mighty is like Jehovah? God is greatly to be feared in the congregation of the saints and to be adored by all around him. O Jehovah, God of hosts, who is a strong Jehovah like you, and your faithfulness is all around you. You rule the pride of the sea. When its waves rise high, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours and the earth is yours. The world in its fullness, you founded them. You have created the north and the south, Tabar, Tabar and Hermon. Rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is high. Justice and righteousness are your throne's foundation. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed is the people knowing the joyful sound. O Jehovah, they shall walk in the light of your face. They shall rejoice in your name always, and they are exalted in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor you lift up 
our horn. For Jehovah is our shield, yea, the Holy One of Israel, our King. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One, and you said, I have laid help on a mighty one. I have exalted a chosen one from the people. I have found my servant David. I have anointed him with my holy oil. My hand shall be fixed with him, and my arm shall make him strong. An enemy will not exact against him, nor the son of iniquity afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before him, and plague those hating him. But my faithfulness and my mercy is with him, and his horn shall be exalted in my name. And I will set his hand in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry to me, My Father, you are my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. I will keep my mercy for him forever, and my covenant shall hold fast with him. And I have established his seed forever, and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his sons forsake my law, and do not walk in my judgments, if they profane my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, then I will visit their transgressions with the rod, and their sins with stripes. But I will not annul my mercy from him, and I will not be false in my faithfulness. I will not profane my covenant nor change what goes from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall be forever and his throne is the sun before me. Like the moon it shall be forever and a faithful witness in the sky. Selah. But you have cast off and rejected us. You have passed over on your anointed. You have turned away from the covenant of your servant. You have defiled his crown on the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a curse to his neighbors. You have set up the right hand of his enemies. You have made all his enemies rejoice. And you have turned back the edge of his sword and have not held him up in battle. You have made his glory to cease, and have hurled his throne to the ground. You have shortened the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame, Selah. O Jehovah, until when will you hide yourself? Shall your wrath burn like, for, like fire forever? What man lives and never sees death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of Sheol? Selah. Lord, where are your former kindnesses that you swore to David in your faithfulness? Remember, O Lord, the reproach of your servants, my bearing in my bosom, the insults of the many peoples, with which your enemies have cursed, O Jehovah, with which they have cursed the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be, Jehovah, forever. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and give you thanks for being able to proclaim your word. We give you thanks for the eternal covenant of grace. We give you thanks for the eternal covenant of wrath. Lord, we thank you for the eternal covenant of your glory you have purposed from before the world was eternally to do this. These things are well pleasing in your sight. We rejoice in them for you have given us a heart whereby we concur with your word and say amen. We agree. We've been made to agree by the power of your spirit. We thank you for that work of creation renewing us unto your image, making us in your likeness, even more so than that of Adam, as now we see you more in the fullness of your glory. Though now we do know you in part, 
We long for the day when you, our faith, will be made sight. We will no longer see as a, in a mirror dimly, but we will behold you as, as you are. Pray that you would be with us this week. Keep us safe. Go before us. Prepare our way. We trust in your sovereignty and we have comfort in it. We pray that um, you'll be with the saints who are in different areas that we know and those who we don't know, even as Elijah did not know of the 7,000 who would not bow the knee to Baal. Pray that you would reveal them to us. We pray that you would regenerate your people, those who you love, those who are our brothers who have not yet been born again. Pray that you would um, return us all here next week. Pray that your those who are sick amongst your people that we know that you would give them healing. We pray that you would give them encouragement in your gospel in these words. And that we would be a people who are eagerly awaiting for you to come and to save those without reference to sin. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.